Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is uh, the first day of October, uh, and we have yet another wonderful uh, case for our biopsy conference. Um, as usual, we have no disclosures, and the patient has been de-identified. Uh, the CME activity code for this week is 47573. Uh, you'll have till next Tuesday to fill that in and get your CME credit. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Geisinger Nephrology Fellowship from uh, Danville, Pennsylvania. They're joining us. And we've got some uh, people from Ochsner Clinic in uh, New Orleans as well. So uh, we want to encourage as many programs to join us as possible. It's very exciting. Uh, we think this is a great um, addition to many people's curriculum, curricula. And uh, let's get started. Bill, uh, Dr. Whittier's case, and I think uh, Dr. Uh, Balut is reading the, the protocol. Yes, I'll go ahead and get started. So. Uh, the patient is a 75-year-old black man with a significant past medical history of well-controlled hypertension, BPH, and gout, who presented for evaluation of AKI. Six months prior to presentation, his baseline serum creatinine was 1.2. Urinalysis at that time was significant for small blood with four RBCs and trace protein. Prior urinalyses in the past showed similar findings with trace blood and protein. Um, on his presentation, his serum creatinine was elevated at 4.17, and urinalysis again showed trace blood and trace protein. Quantification of the, uh, of the urine showed low-grade proteinuria with UPC of 0.5 grams per gram and a UAC of 0.1 grams per gram. He had reported recently starting taking naproxen for lower back pain, um, and he had been taking it kind of intermittently for the past year or so. He additionally was taking PPI, uh, PPI, I think pantoprazole, which he had started within the past week um, while he was waiting a results of a recent endoscopy that he got. He had stopped his naproxen and the PPI um, two weeks and, and we checked labs again in two weeks and his serum creatinine was elevated still at 4.6. Symptomatically, he felt fine aside from chronic nocturia and fatigue that he endorsed. Um, in terms of his past medical history, he had high blood pressure high blood pressure that was relatively well controlled, BPH, gout, history of spinal stenosis, and osteoarthritis. Prior surgeries, he had a L5 S1 microdiscectomy done three years ago. Um, no smoking, no drug use, and no alcohol use that he endorsed. Family history was notable for diabetes in both his mother and sister, but no family history of any renal disease. Um, review of symptoms was positive for nocturia and fatigue um, and lower back pain that was chronic for him. He had no allergies to any medications. In terms of the medications he was taking, he was on Herbisartan, Allopurinol, Gabapentin, Simvastatin, um, and Tramadol, and then the naproxen and pantoprazole, which were discontinued. On physical exam, his vital signs were stable, yet he was normal tensive. Um, and he was setting well on room air. His physical exam was essentially unremarkable. Um, his lungs were clear. He had no abdominal tenderness, no flank tenderness, no skin rashes, no joint pain, or no joint, no, no joint swelling. So on his labs, two weeks after stopping the naproxen and the pantoprazole, his CMP was notable for a serum sodium of 141, potassium of 5.3, chloride of 108 and a bicarb of 20. His BU1 was 62 and his creatinine was 4.63 at that time. Um, normal blood glucose level and his albumin was 3.5 with a calcium of 7.4. Um, LFTs were unremarkable. On CBC, he had a white count of 6.2 with normal diff, a hemoglobin of 8.6 um, that was normal acidic and a platelet count of 219,000. Um, ferritin was 490 and his iron stat was 35%. Haptoglobin was normal at 197. Um, he had a hemoglobin A1C that had been checked um, fairly recently and it was normal 4.8, so not in the diabetic or pre-diabetic range. On lipid panel, his cholesterol was elevated at 199, elevated LDL of 138 and triglyceride of 84. Um, his urinalysis was again notable for trace protein and small blood um, with four RBCs on that. And the quantification, like we talked, like we mentioned before, was 0.5 grams per gram on the, on the UPC and 0.1 grams per gram on the UAC. 
In terms of his serological workup, his ANA was negative. Um, SSA and SSB were both negative as well. SFEP and UPEP were unremarkable without any monoclonal protein. Um, and his ACE level was normal. We also got an IgG4 level, and that was within the reference range as well. On renal ultrasound, he had bilateral echogenicity in his kidneys. The right one measured 11.9 centimeters in length, and the left kidney was 12.2 centimeters in length. Um, he did have a simple uh, 1.5 centimeter cyst in his, up, in his left kidney, um, but there was no masses or hydronephrosis. Um, we did perform, we ended up performing a CT guided uh, renal biopsy. Great. Uh, so I have a couple questions. Um, was this just incidentally picked up? Was it routine labs? It sounds like uh, not a lot was going on clinically. That's right. It was routine labs. So out of the clear blue, this guy sees his doctor and he's found to have a creatinine four. Yeah, he saw his internist, his creatinine was four, six months ago, it was normal. Um, the internist was like, this is crazy. Let me stop the naproxen in your PPI and see what it is in two weeks. Two weeks later, it was 4.6. Yeah. Good for the internist, quite frankly. Um, anybody else have any uh, other questions? Yeah, um, I, I have a couple. Um, were there any serophy light chains checked, A and B, um, any ANCA? The serum-free light was checked, uh, sorry about that, and the ratio was elevated, but it was consistent with chronic kidney disease. Uh, and then I think you said, what else did you ask? Anka, Anka was not checked. Okay. Uh, so I'm wondering if there's any finding on the urine sediment or was bland? Uh, no, it was bland. Great. Um, so let's start a discussion and uh, generate a differential diagnosis. Uh, Praveer, you want to uh, give us a discussion? Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> we have a 75-year-old uh, gentleman coming in, uh, has a baseline of 1.2 with some hypertension, some trace protein, all of a sudden has AKI. Um, now, in, ter in terms of, first of all, his baseline creatinine, I was looking at, he may have some already some mild CKD. Uh, could be, you know, hypertension, he has some trace protein. So given his demographics, you know, I was thinking he may already have a secondary FSGS uh, with the hypertension, maybe able one given demographics, but he has this acute rise to 4.1. And the biggest thing here in the history is the naproxen, the PPI. Um, and so, you know, once I saw that, I'm thinking acute interstitial nephritis plus minus ATN. Um, and so I think that's the biggest thing. And uh, that kind of jumps out in the HPI. Um, in terms of uh, other kind of risks for his AKI as I was going through this, allopurinol, and I think that's why ANCA was potentially mentioned. There's uh, association with that, maybe potentially vasculitis. He's also older, 75. Um, so you start worrying about that, but we'll get to the UA, which again, we look to, but, uh, and then in terms of his uh, physical exam, he is obese, uh, not morbid obese, but um, think about other risk factors for kind of just kidney disease and kind of obesity related glomerulopathy, but that wouldn't explain his acute rise. So, so f uh, the biggest thing that jumps out to me is really his, you know, uh, medication use. Um, now, it didn't get better, but that could be because he had ATN and not AIN. And when you look at the UA, it kind of goes along with a primarily tubular interstitial uh, cause. Um, he has, you know, trace protein, minimal blood, not many whites, and his you know, UAC to UPC ratio, uh, again, points to more tubular or non-albuminuria, albin, albumin, albumin proteinuria. Um, he has very minimal albumin. So you know, I, I think AIN and ATN um, still high, and you look at the SPEP, UPEP, which should be considered with this age and this uh, discrepancy of his uh, proteinuria, and that was negative. So I don't think a pair of protein uh, was up there. So, you know, I, I, I really think this is AIN and ATN. Uh, his creatinine, you know, sometimes with these AINs, you stop the medications like he did and didn't get better, but that may be because he has some ATN that's unresolved or um, he still has ongoing a AIN, which requires further treatment. Um, I think he'll have some mild chronicity given his baseline was 1.2 and he already had trace protein before and I wouldn't be surprised to see some segmental scars, but that won't explain his AKI. Um, I, other causes of tubular interstitial disease, the ACE level is uh, normal. We don't have a chest x-ray. He's black, sarcoid, it could be considered. 
Uh, I don't see any evidence of there, so I think that's very unlikely. IgG4, thinking about IgG4 related disease and tubular interstices, that's again unlikely, along with SARS uh, with um, sorry, Sjogren's and other autoimmune diseases, seems unlikely. So I'm going to put AIN and ATN as my top. And then um, just because we don't have an ANCA and alpirinol, I'll put a vasculitis, and maybe the UA is lying. Um, Wouldn't be the first time the UA is shown to be a little more bland and we're surprised on the biopsy. So uh, I'll put that second. Uh, but I'd be surprised if we see anything outside of just kind of tubular interstitial disease. So it's uh, what really strikes me about this case is the uh, fact that uh, this is just out of the clear blue, you know. And granted, people can present with ATN, but usually there's something. This guy's, you know, living his life with a little bit of gout and comes in with ATN totally asymptomatically. It's if that's what it is, I mean, it's pretty surprising. On the other hand, it's hard to believe he has a systemic disease either, although we have clearly seen patients that with, with renal-limited vasculitis, I had renal, completely renal-limited lupus that has been picked up with, with bad uh, lupus GN, purely picked up because of creatinine, which led to a biopsy and there were no symptoms and the person just got lucky that he had labs around that time. So all that stuff, as you say, can happen. But there's a lot of it that's unusual uh, that that, that kind of makes it a, a tough diagnosis. Clearly, um, uh, Dr. Whittier uh, was looking at the interstitial uh, 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 diseases because uh, look at what he ordered serologically: uh, Sjogren's and and uh, IgG4 and ACE level, et cetera. And those aren't uh, none of those are 100 percent, but uh, it sure points along the way. And I, I guess that's why Prevera kind of leaves you with drugs, right? That would be the only thing that all of a sudden, I mean, like you said, just going about his way, he gets routine labs. And I guess sometimes this is how we pick up these AINs from PPIs and naproxen. They get started mm -hmm. for whatever reason. So, uh, Dr. Gashti, uh, you're our, uh, uh, our local uh, uh, AIN magnet. It seems like you uh, represent 90% of the uh, cases. Uh, so I'm going to put you on if you're, if you're, uh, online here and you can tell us what your thoughts are about this. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with Dr. Baxi's differential. I think that the urinalysis does direct us towards a tubular interstitial process. Um, you know, he essentially went through most of uh, the differential with regards to the PPIs and the NSAIDs. The only things that I would like to add would be that he does have gout, hypertension, CKD, and anemia. So lead nephropathy is, is a possibility, although I don't know why a 75-year-old would all of a sudden in the past six months develop that without any further history. But, but that's usually the, the triad of, of that can, can, can give you that differential of, of lead nephropathy. Is that, ever, is that ever acute renal failure? It's, well, I don't know if this is acute. This is, you know, this could be chronic. I mean, we don't have well, any six, data points. We've got six months ago, we had a credit of 1.2. Yeah. So that's three months is the, the, is, is the cutoff line between acute and chronic. So I'm not really sure. Yeah. This could have been something that happened. He could have had interstitial nephritis four months ago from the PPI. And then he just kind of burned out the kidney. Now he's four and his urine is not really that active. So, so we may not actually find a lot of cellular infiltrate in the kidney. If you look at the urine, I mean, there's not that much there. I mean, five white cells, four red cells. So I'm not really quite sure if, you know, we're going to see a whole lot of, except a lot of fibrosis. ATN, I, I, I have a hard time believing people walking around feeling okay, just develop ATN in the community. It's, I, I see that a lot more as an inpatient, but, but that's obviously a possibility. Uh, lymphoma infiltrating the kidney, something like that. Sometimes you see imaging evidence of that, but lymphoma in an older gentleman with renal failure of otherwise unexplained etiology, that's a possibility. Uh, we talked about vasculitis, ANCAs pending or, or not checked. Uh, again, the, the urine is just very unimpressive for that. But having said that, I think we have seen that, that the urinalysis is a little misleading and that we're not seeing as much uh, activity, but then the patient does actually have vasculitis. It, it fits. I mean, the in biopsy series of, of uh, AKI in, in, in the elderly, one of the most common causes of renal failure was vasculitis. So that, that's definitely on the differential. But again, that's not tubular interstitial. We think there is tubular interstitial disease here based on the urinalysis and, and the urine, um, uh, uh, yeah, the urinalysis and, and also the UPC versus the UAC. The, there's, the ratio seems to favor a tubular interstitial process. So uh, 
in addition to what Dr. Baxi said, I'm just gonna add lead nephropathy, lymphoma, and, and uh, he already said vasculitis, so I'm gonna stop there. Um, I don't know if it was in the protocol or not, but uh, was, did he have a peripheral eosinophilia? It said, it said normal differential, uh, is okay. what Dr. Balut read, said normal, normal diff. So uh, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? Does that sway you one way or the Does, other? If it's there, it's helpful. Um, it's another data point that would support an, an, an interstitial nephritis, or at least a drug-induced interstitial nephritis because of the presence of eosinophilia. But the fact that it's not there does, doesn't necessarily rule it out. And um, I know we've, uh, you know, we were one of the first programs that, that, that uh, presented uh, urine eosinophils as a distinguishing factor for interstitial nephritis. This was back when I was a fellow, um, even. And, uh, and that got, that caught on. It became very popular for years to go for urine eosinophils. And, uh, and I remember there was a point when I was a fellow that everybody with AKI got urine eosinophils. Well, you know, just it turns out that even our data did not find it to be, even though that we were promoting it as a test, if you look at our data, it was very not, very unsensitive and very, non-specific and therefore people now uh many people have written that they it isn't really a useful test we don't get them anymore i think it should be a test that's not done simply because it's i mean it would be one thing if it's not sensitive but we're specific but it's not even specific i think the number one cause of high ear, ear and eosinophil count in our series was a urinary tract infection so i don't know if people are still doing it but i would suggest that you don't um don't don't waste your time on that we're then we're kind of left, you know, with this uh, little bit of pyuria, funny story. Uh, I tend to put a lot of weight on the UPC to UAC ratio, the only 20% uh, of the protein being albumin, which of course Prevere pointed out. I, I, I've always liked that, that most glomerular diseases, you would expect it to be closer to 50 or 60%. Um, and, uh, and go from there. Um, I think that's a good discussion. I think it's time to spin the wheel and um, see who uh, reads the biopsy. So let me... Uh, Put the wheel up. Well, it's me and I'm not reading it. I guess I am. <laughs> We always say the wheel doesn't lie, and it the came to me twice. You. The wheel, the wheel, the wheel usually gets what it wants, and so I think that, that the wheel has spoken, and that's a message. So I'm kind of stuck. So um, okay, we've got David. You on? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're good, Dave. So uh, David's our renal pathologist who's going to be with us here. So we've got three cores, um, and I'm looking. This is a trichrome, I assume, and I'm looking at blue staining material. Um, and there's, you know, there looks like there's some areas here that are really not, I'd have to see it on higher power, but it doesn't look that healthy, for instance, here. And, um, uh, yeah, yeah, for example, look at the top core. That's uh, entirely uh, sclerosed. Yeah. And we do see some glands. We see some, perhaps some sclerosed glands too, but it's, you know, for instance here, but it uh, doesn't look like a real healthy kidney, to be honest. So I think there's been some chronicity and that's about all I'd say. Don't, we don't, certainly don't see a lot of healthy tubules either, but yeah. here's a nice section of healthy tubules, but then uh, it, that's, it doesn't look like a very healthy kidney. So I think, you know, to Casey's point, chronicity three to six months, I mean, something has been going on more than a week. We'll put it that way. David, yeah. what did we call this? 50%? Uh, yeah, 50 to yeah, 75 75. Okay. All right. Next slide. I can advance. Uh, here, uh, this looks like a silver already. Yeah. The tail okay. of two glomeruli. Ah, okay. The tail of two glomeruli. Well, on the left, we have the best of time, times and on the right, we have the worst of times. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because on the left is, uh, we get our, this disease is clearly now, um, Focal because we have one that looks like a pretty normal glomerulus here, and this is an abnormal glomerulus here. So here you can see the capillaries are, the, the glomerulus is filling uh, Bowman space, the capillary loopings are, are patent. Um, we'll have a higher power at some point, but we, won't, we don't see any obvious pathology, no breaks, um, no, um, no holes, no spikes. It looks pretty normal here. I think this is not, th th I think, well, actually, this is a little nodule with little rings around it here, but I don't think that's anything. David, is this anything? Yeah, I think they're just unlysed red cells. Okay. 
And then on the right here, the, these were the worst of times. We have uh, a glomerulus that it's not filling Bowman space. It looks like it's uh, kind of, uh, you know, collapsed on itself a little bit. And we've got some epithelial cell reaction here um, that yeah. yes, sometimes that, that, is interpreted. That, 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 was the, that, that was the key word, collapsed. It's originally described by Mel Schwartz as a cellular lesion. He, you know, before this, this lesion was uh, called collapsing FSGS, he called it the cellular lesion of focal sclerosis because it had, we had these reactive epithelial cells out here that you can actually see quite, quite in quite many areas around the, uh, around the glomerulus. And, you know, uh, that's really what I think we're seeing. I don't know that there's anything else here. Right. Yeah, um, yeah you're seeing wrinkling, implosion, collapse of the glomerular capillaries, and then podocytes proliferating around those areas of injury. Which was what, the, what he, which which was what he called the cellular lesion. Um, you know, this is not what we expected. We were expecting a tubular interstitial disease. If you look at the interstitium here, it's fairly fibrotic and the tubule is very trophic. Um, there are some normal ones to the bottom right um, and a piece of a glomerulus in the on the right that might be a little more normal. But um, uh, this is, on the top here, we've got better looking tubules, but these tubules may be associated with this dying glomerulus, so it's hard to say, but it's not an acute interstitial nephritis at least on this slide, which is what we were kind of expecting to find, acute and chronic based on drug. We, did not, we were not expecting a glomerular lesion based on the degree of proteinuria, uh, his presentation, and um, uh, yeah, the degree of proteinuria. Um, we were, we, nobody brought up a single glomerular, glomerular, which is appropriate given the protocol. Um, here's a higher power. This is really nice because here's a higher power. You can really see the wrinkling here of the basement membranes. You can see that they're, it's pretty much collapsing and you can really very nicely see the uh, epithelial cells here that are, you know, prol proliferating all, all and around this, uh, around this glomerulus. Yeah. And, and then where your arrow was, there was some protein droplets uh, over to the left. If you go straight over to the left, yeah, within a podocyte there. Yeah, yeah that's really that's nice, yeah. Feature. And so here we've got four glomeruli, um, and I guess just various degrees of this. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so this was widespread. There, I mean, there's 32 gloms, 12 are globally sclerosed, and then 16 uh, have uh, segmental scars with collapsing features. So you can see how how widespread this is. So that's what, what uh, over 50 percent. I'm sorry, I wasn't. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, you have 50% of this lesion and have 500 or whatever milligrams of proteinuria. It's just, uh, I don't know how to, I don't even how to put that together, but that's, I guess, why we do biopsies. Um, yeah, 80% still... of, of the viable glomeruli had collapsing lesions. Wow. Yeah. Here's a uh, PAS with a pretty good looking glomerulus. Um, it's on the edge there, but it isn't, you know, it, it looks pretty, pretty healthy. Um, the cellularity looks pretty good and the basement membranes look pretty good here. Uh, yeah, one of, one of the few healthy ones. I don't know, these, these are um, tubular casts here, uh, protonaceous casts, uh, again, some collapse, uh, uh, yeah, some hyalinosis in this glomerulus. Yeah, hyalinosis in the bottom, and then an uh, yeah, area of, of, of cortical scarring. You have fibrosis between the tubules, tubular atrophy with thickened basement membranes. And but then again, I mean, there is severe disease in the tubular interstitium, but, it's, but it, it may well represent a, a primary glomerular disease and not a primary tubular interstitium. What you certainly don't see is collapsing GN from a tubular disease. You can see a lot of tubular disease from a glomerular disease. So I think that this is probably related you know, to the dying glomeruli. Um, and there's some cellular infiltrate here, but it's certainly not, you know, this is a chronic pro process, and I would suspect it's from glomerular dropout more than, the, I don't think this is a primary interstitial nephritis. And, and David, were there any eosinophils here in the interstitial? No, 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 no the, the lymphocytes are associated with areas of scarring like we see here. Okay, uh, next slide. A uh, higher power, um, um, and you can see some protein reabsorption droplets here. Um, don't really see a good brush border. Yeah. Uh, certainly these 
tubules uh, higher up here, if my pointer's still showing, but these tubules higher up here are atrophic and you can see the thickened uh, basement membranes of those. So you've got uh, some acute and chronic damage here and some interstitial infiltrate. Yep. Um, and then more, just more evidence of tubular damage. I don't yeah, think this and, is- and look at the, yeah, tubular drop, protein reabsorption droplets. Yeah, There's... it looks, I mean, it, it's tempting to, to call this uh, red cells, but they're too small. And these are just, this is, you can see these round blobs here and that's all protein reabsorption. So it's pretty impressive, which yeah. is odd because this patient, unless this patient is filtering a lot of protein <laughs> and has like super tubules and, re and reabsorbing it. I mean, we, we look at the urinary protein as an evidence of, of what the glomerular lesion is, and it really isn't. But the tubular, pro what, what we see in a 24-hour urine or protein creatinine ratio is what's left over after what's being filtered and what's, what's being resorbed or not re being reabsorbed. So, I mean, one theory here, and I think it's probably folly, but one theory here is he actually is, pro it really actually is filtering a lot of proteinuria, but reabsorbing it. Um, and I don't know why that would be the case here because we don't usually see that with glomerulopathies, but this is really very impressive tubular reabsorption droplets, which implies that this proteinuria is a lot more than we would have anticipated from the pr protein creatinine ratio of, of 0.5, 500 milligrams per gram, um, you know, fitting, you know, half a gram or a gram, whatever, a day of proteinuria. Uh, next slide. So the IgG is negative. Uh, so uh, no surprise, but you never know. Um, Next slide. And, and David, that means that the, everything was negative. There was yeah, no, there was no, negative. there was no kappa restriction or light chain restriction or anything to, for us to right. think. Given his age, and he did have a little bit of gamma or gaps that somebody pointed out in, on, in the chat board. Um, so nothing there to suggest that. Um, here we've got a, 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 a an electron micrograph. I don't know if my pointer is still showing, but here's the, uh, the urine space, and here's uh, here's the blood space, and here's the urine space. No, it's the other way around. Here's the blood space, and here's the urine space. Uh, actually, I can't tell because I can't see podocytes. I suppose. Um, yeah, the, the blood this, this is, is where this is where blood space, and this is your yeah. This is blood space, and this is urine space. Okay, and we'll yeah, see the podocytes yeah. on higher power. Uh, yeah. But I don't see what I don't. See, here's a wide mesangium. It's probably scarred. There's a lot of wrinkling here, which we which we we're not surprised. And um, uh, but I don't see any electron dense deposits. I don't see any. Um, uh, whole spikes or anything. It's really just a kind of shrunken, wrinkled uh, uh, EM. Yep. And the next slide. Uh, again, uh, here's some, you can see some uh, some villus transformation here yeah. outside. This is kind of a probably an activated podocyte, right? Yeah, right. Um, yeah, actually, yeah. You can see the base membranes wrinkled and collapsed. This is one of those areas of collapse. Uh, yeah, yeah. it's really nice, actually, because it really makes the point of the wrinkling and the collapse. I, I really, really like this. And the, in the, and this is like a massive uh, podocyte. You know, there's yeah. no podocyte. It's all completely fused here. Um, and again, when you when you see villus transformation, I've always associated with a lot of proteinuria, um, and um, yet this patient doesn't have a lot of proteinuria, but he has a lot of protein reabsorption. So there's a lot of questions that I'm sure Dr. Whittier is going to be able to answer for us on this when he puts this case together for us. Um, more of the same uh, diffuse foot process effacement here. Um, and uh, not much of a lumen left here, you know, as these things get collapsed, a little less wrinkling, but wrinkled here. Um, next yep. slide. So my diagnosis is, uh, I guess, collapsing FSGS and not much of, with, with a secondary interstitial fibrosis, but I don't, I don't believe it's a primary um, uh, interstitial nephritis, which is what we predicted. I think uh, this is uh, caught everybody off guard um, and, um, And uh, that's really that's really about it. So, um, Prevere, what are your thoughts about this yeah. case? Well, surprised and shocked. I mean, that like you kind of mentioned. I mean, the ton of chronicity, which was always a concern, but I mean, a primarily a glomerular lesion there with a collapsing FSGS. Uh, I mean, I would like to know uh, uh, in terms of other workup. Um, kind of going back to his, uh, I guess the protocol. I mean, his HIV status. When I see collapsing FSGS, I'm thinking HIV, parvo, um, you know, uh, other medications and drugs, uh, which not pertinent in this case. But we think of bisphosphonates, pimidinate, lithium, other causes of collapsing FSGS. Um, 
And um, I'll go back to the protocol because I think that's going to be the first question. Um, didn't seem like we had any of that. It wasn't really on, something that we were thinking of. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just in a, just, so that's what I would like to know first. Um, I don't know, Bill, we have any of those? It, yeah, um, I certainly was caught off guard, uh, so much so that I really didn't even do a serologic glomerular workup before the biopsy mm -hmm. um, for glomerular disease. Uh, could you go to the last slide after uh, yeah. case is finished? So yeah, my first thought too was, oh, I was missing an HIV. Um, so we checked that and it was negative. We checked his parvovirus and his IgM was negative. And then also, um, you know, worried about COVID. He actually had a COVID test prior to the biopsy uh, and that was negative as well. If you could advance, next slide. But uh, what I did is I also checked his uh, COVID antibodies. And even though he had not had a, even a sniffle in the last uh, six months, and he had oh no God. fevers and he had no symptoms, he actually ended up having COVID antibodies that were positive. Um, so that was also a surprise. Um, and so the, the real way I was trying to think of putting this together is of course, we've got a collapsing FSGS in person who has been exposed to COVID at some point. And uh, you can maybe go, maybe, uh, got it. So this, you know, so we know that COVID has been rampant and, uh, and, and this came out of China where, um, uh, it was actually a uh, visual abstract put together by Bay of Conception, one of our previous fellows. Uh, but they looked at all the AKI associated with COVID and not surprising, uh, they had a high mortality with AKI and on dialysis, but only about 7% of patients were getting AKI. Um, this really wasn't the classic AKI that we were seeing, which was ATN and thrombotic microangiopathy. This is more of a glomerular lesion. And so if you can go to the next one. When they had biopsy people who came in with nephrotic syndrome, again, different from my case here because he didn't have nephrotic syndrome. If anything, he looked clinically tubular interstitial, but he had his glomerular disease and the glomerular disease that we saw in him was the one that was really associated the most with, with COVID. And so in this study of, uh, I think there were uh, 17 patients with COVID, 14 uh, from native and three from transplants. This was from uh, Degati's experience in New York. They noticed that a, a six of them had a podocytopathy lesion. And so collapsing glomerulopathy was really the, the main uh, uh, glomerular lesion that they saw in patients who had had COVID. Yeah, next slide. And so, you know, this is also recently after the COVID experience from Nasser and Cop, and the, what they showed is here's all the different causes of our collapsing uh, FSGS. And, and a lot of this was what Dr. Baxi had mentioned as differential as well as I saw some in the chat with, you know, pemidronate exposure, HIV, and et cetera. And those are the classic ones, but even um, now it's really becoming a lot more associated with, uh, with COVID-19. At least we had that, that positive test in him. And so interestingly, in the uh, black population who, uh, uh, especially are in those patients who have APOL1 risk alleles, uh, they found that, that uh, COVID-19 is really the second hit or that the, the coronavirus infection is really the second hit that can push these people over get to getting the collapsing glomerulopathy. And in this study where they uh, looked at their patients who had collapsing glomerulopathy, uh, all six of them had some sort of abnormal allele uh, for ApoL1. And so when we see a black patient who comes in now with collapsing glomerulopathy and they have positive COVID, we really need to think about uh, if they have ApoL1 abnormalities in their risk alleles. And I think Juan Carlos might even be on. We knew Juan Carlos uh, Velez back in the day when he was a resident that rotated through Rush before he became a world famous nephrologist. But I see, I see somebody from New Orleans is on, so I don't know if he's on there. But uh, he recently published this paper, um, which really said that, you know, we used to talk about high van all the time as the main cause and driver of a uh, collapsing FSGS, but uh, we aren't seeing nearly as much of that because HIV is so well controlled now. And that the new term might be COVAN. COVAN. Uh, or COVID-associated nephropathy is the, is the new collapsing FSGS that we're going to see at least for the year 2020. Um, so the real question remains is, is if this is due to COVID, uh, which I didn't have another good explanation of what else it could be considering everything else that I tried to test for was negative and he didn't have a history of any of the other medications, the next question is what to do. Um, and I don't know if you want to ask around, Roger, about uh, a treatment or talk about what yeah. I did. So yeah, yeah I think I, I'm from, sorry to interrupt, uh, uh, Al-Quds here from Oshner, uh, a colleague of Dr. Velez. Yeah, so we noticed uh, 
I guess we uh, collaborated with the two lane next to us and we uh, got uh, three cases, two here and one in two lane. Uh, all of them were biopsy proven collapsing FSGS with the COVID. No other ex explanation uh, on the chart, but all of these people were actually sick, you know, kind of symptomatic. But I've just noticed uh, in the last couple of weeks, I have a patient that she was COVID positive incidentally, and she presented with AKI uh, kind of similar to this, but because she's kind of chronic advanced CKD, I didn't biopsy her, but I'm pretty sure there's something something on like lingering there in her kidneys and probably causing the collapsing FSGS, you know. Yeah, and so, something I, I didn't mention was, you know, I still don't have a very good explanation for why there's still little albuminuria and little total proteinuria. And, and one explanation could be an increased tubular reabsorption as Dr. Robbie was mentioning. But another one, I was possibly considering that it was just that he was in such bad acute kidney injury, he really wasn't filtering any protein at the time. And we've seen that all in patients who have AKI with uh, minimal change due to ATN. Then once their ATN gets better, they start pouring out grams and grams of proteinuria. And so I was also considering that um, if he does get better, he, we, may are, we may start to see proteinuria uh, as his renal function improves if it does. Uh, do you have information about his albumin? See, was it low? Is it a part of the nephrotic syndrome? Uh, yeah, was that on the protocol? I think it was, I think it was relatively normal. Uh, yeah, it was a 3.4. Yeah, his yeah, albumin was a 3.5, sorry. Yeah. Hey, uh, Bill, can I say yes. something quick? It's interesting, so I had a lady um, came in two weeks ago. She's diabetic. I'd never seen her before. She hadn't been to our hospital. I was able to get records from February. Um, creatinine was 1.8 and her albumin was 3.8. Um, she came in chiefly to the ER because of diarrhea for two months, and we drew her labs. Her, her creatinine was 11, and her albumin was 1.7. Um, since everybody gets COVID tested, she tested COVID positive. She also had C. diff, which was the result of her, which was the cause of her diarrhea. She was diabetic, but we, I biopsied her anyway, and uh, she's got collapsing FSGS. So it, asymptomatic COVID, nephrotic syndrome, collapsing FSGS. I mean, she's on dialysis. The rest of her kidneys shot, but... I'm sure that's what it is. And I, my assumption was that the, the FSGS that they were seeing was mostly with, you know, pretty symptomatic and sick COVID patients, but apparently that's not the case, obviously. Well, we also think about the collapsing FSGS of HIV as being one where you don't have edema, even though you can have nephrotic syndrome, you don't have hypertension, even though you have the class. Uh, so, you, you know, you have, there's a lot of reasons why the theories are behind that, but at least the clinical presentation of nephrotic syndrome isn't always with, you know, with edema uh, when you have high VN. And so in this case, he didn't even have any edema as well, but he also didn't have proteinuria. Dr. Baxi, uh, you had a case uh, with uh, um, collapsing FSGS in, in COVID. Can you just give us your perspective of what happened and what you did? Yeah, the same thing. I mean, as it was kind of these patients, you think that they're really sick. The ones that are really sick at the collapsing FSGS. I mean, this patient came in, uh, no history. Her albumin went in inpatient uh, while on the floors as her COVID symptoms were getting better, went from like three to 1.5. And she had basically acute onset nephrotic syndrome. And uh, we biopsied her. She had collapsing FSGS. We ended up actually doing steroids. Um, uh, and that was pre kind of steroid protocol that we're using now. And believe it or not, she, her, her proteinuria was out of the range of our lab. It was so high that they couldn't even quantitate it. Um, and she came down nicely with steroids. Um, so I, I did treat her and she, uh, in the course of 30 days, her proteinuria went from, you know, above 20 grams down to three. Her creatinine uh, came down from six to three. And um, so I had success. And I didn't have any complications from that. Um, but it was like it was mentioned, these patients sometimes are otherwise stable from their COVID symptoms or could be like this patient, asymptomatic and have severe glomerular lesion from, I guess, Colvan. Yeah, well, that's the COVID. I love that term. And I think that's the, the that's, you know, this is a uh, epithelial cell reaction to a virus. And that's what we've seen in with with many of these, you know, with uh, it was first described with HIV that the virus I was actually in the epithelial cells and, you know, a number of them, including parvo and hep C and, and, and the like. And, you know, you say they got better with steroids, but you don't know if they got better with steroids or not. Um, the patient, so slide. Real quick. So yeah, Bill, 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 why don't you go ahead now? So, so because, you know, Dr. Robbie is so active in the communities and, and especially since we have situations where 
anecdotes need to be the rule for therapy because there's no literature to drive therapy. I mean, we all know that treatment of uh, steroids with, with quote unquote idiopathic FSGS is indicated, treating the underlying viral infections if you can, stopping pendinate obviously, but in COVID really anyone, no one knows. And so Dr. Uh, Robbie was talking about Baxi's case here and about how somebody got a little bit better with steroids. And then um, another nephrologist, Dr. Magoon from Virginia said that he had three cases uh, that were dialysis dependent and he did not uh, give uh, steroids or any Im immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, and these patients were also APOL1 and uh, uh, allele abnorm had APOL1 allele abnormalities. And they actually, all of them got off of dialysis. And so it's possible that the virus just needs to run its course. So in, in this case, I was awfully tempted to give steroids uh, but really, I didn't have an indication. I also had a lot of kidney, which was already fibrosis, scarred down at 75%. So I elected not to give the patient steroids. And this creatinine actually got up to as high as about 5.8. Um, and we were kind of getting him ready for dialysis. And then before that, he uh, turned the corner a little bit. And now his serum creatinine has come all the way down to 3.8. Not, not a lot. I mean, it's not back down to where he was in six months prior to presentation. But he um, he's gotten a lot better and is able to to at least not be on dialysis right now. And I also thought that he was gonna then start pouring out protein uh, because his renal function was getting better, but he still has an AC ratio that's you know 20% and he still has minimal proteinuria. So the best I can think about it is that he did have some sort of nephrotic presentation at one point uh, that caused collapsing FSGS. His kidney's already in the process of recovering um, and, and now he's still, he's getting, he's, he's having recovery and not, not having any signs of the nephrotic syndrome or any nephrotic range proteinuria. Hey Bill, can I, can, I, can I quickly just add something to this uh, sure. very, very briefly? We've had um, you know, at least three or four cases now of transplanted patients that have gotten COVID and it presented very similar fashion. Uh, we have not biopsied them, but it was the working diagnosis was again collapsing um, FSGS. Um, and I can tell you that we have not treated not a single one of them with steroids out of fear that we will worsen their course um, now, although now we know that many patients that have COVID pneumonia obviously benefit from dexamethasone, but we have opted out not to give them steroids. Um, and, you know, they were on some, we have taken them off anti-metabolite, I kept them on, on uh, mo you know, most of the cases, CNI, uh, and they have all actually recovered from their nephrotic syndrome without steroids. And this, these are transplant patients. Yeah, so they're all, but they're all, they are on some baseline immunosuppression, but I think that's a good right. point. I mean, you know, uh, we don't really know. We don't have any idea. We're, we're, we're all dealing with anecdotes here. Right. Um, I, I, you know, the idiopathic um, uh, collapsing FSGS, Dr. Corbett's written about in the past, and, you know, who knows what all, some of those other patients have, uh, uh, what other virus or whatever other second hit they had at the time, but there is some evidence that steroids improve the outcome of, of uh, idiopathic non-viral identified uh, collapsing FSGS. So it's not an unreasonable thing to do. And of course, we would always give it under the guidance of ID. Uh, and as Dr. Peeve said, you know, the steroids might actually be good for preventing them, you know, for the, 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 the lung symptoms of, of COVID. But whether or not it's good for COVID is a whole nother thing. And I think that we're all, this is like a, a, an evidence-free zone right now. Um, I think we just have to be careful uh, what we do. And uh, I don't think uh, anybody knows. Um, Dr. Ot Alcudacy, I'm sorry, I apologize. From Ochsner, do you yeah. have any uh, feelings on steroids? Well, uh, I don't think I mean, the two cases that uh, we encountered here were by Dr. Velez, uh, Juan Carlos. I don't think anybody was treated with the steroids. I guess the steroids was part of the treatment for the, you know, COVID as in a, like a, for a systemic, as a systemic disease, but not necessarily for the FSGS. And uh, I have to follow up, to be honest, I don't know what happened with the patients, but uh, we, here in our institution, we don't just initiate the steroids for the FSGS collapsing uh, from COVID. So. Well, that's great. So um, anybody else have any more comments or, or suggestions on uh, this case? Well, it'll be interesting to see how he does. I mean, that was a severely damaged kidney. So, I, you know, I'd be surprised if he does very well. And uh, uh, regardless of how he's doing now, I think these, his future is bad. And it's very unfortunate because... Um, but maybe it's fortunate he didn't die of COVID too. I mean, there's always a bright side of everything, but uh, we're really learning more and more about uh, all these uh, fascinating 
uh, uh, ApoL1, we don't know that, but I, I'll bet he's ApoL1, high-risk allele positive, and second hit. Um, and um, even if we were to identify people that were ApoL, high-risk ApoL1, it's not, we would tell them, you know, to avoid your second hit. Well, that's, that's ridiculous, you know, uh, you know, because people don't ask for second hits, they just come along unexpectedly. But maybe we'll understand this more in the future, and maybe there'll be some targeted therapy as we get along. But right now, we're kind of stuck, and uh, hopefully, waiting for the uh, virus, the anti, for the virus to get better and the patient to get better. I don't think it's unreasonable to, to try a course of steroids, if but I don't know that. Um, you know, it depends what kind of doctor you are. If you, if you, how much evidence you need to try things. So. I think it's a good idea, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest it per se. And I, I think that anybody's answer is right on this because we don't really know what to do. Um, well, thank you very much, everybody. This is a, a great conference. Uh, and uh, remember the activity code 47573. Uh, get your friends involved, fellowship programs, invite other fellowships. We want to let continue this to grow. This will be posted up in YouTube by uh, early, late, uh, late next week. Um, Go to YouTube, watch our other conferences, and, uh, and join our channel, please. Thank you for everybody, and uh, everybody stay safe.